Good morning everybody, my name is Scott Hunter, I'm the Cyber Resilience and Internet Safety uh, Education Officer for Education Scotland. In this presentation um, today we're going to be um, looking at why cyber resilience and not digital skills. This is part of Cyber Week Scotland which has three main aims, protection, innovation, skills and careers. And if you want to find anything, anything else out about Cyber Scotland Week then you can go to the website and there's lots of um, professional learning opportunities within that website which you can log on to and register for that we're taking that's taking place this week. So as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at why cyber resilience and not digital skills. So you can see we've got some images on the slides here. The, the top one is Microsoft Teams, then we've got Microsoft Outlook, which is email, and these are digital skills, digital tools. So when you're using these, your digital skills enables you to set up meetings in Teams, enables you to use the, the, the controls within each team meeting. And then with Outlook and your email, your digital skills is your ability to send emails, um, you know, set up a group and send emails with your group. So there's lots of different digital skills you need to use these tools. But we are, what we're looking at today is cyber resilience, and that's the second row down, the images at the bottom of the screen. This is things like cyberbullying if you're working with youth work. Um, it could be malware viruses that can affect computers. And it can be scams like um, your phishing scams. And there's an increase in romance scams just now through um, information I'm getting through Police Scotland that's targeting the loneliness of lockdown. So if you're working with adult learners, you might be, have to be more aware of this increase in romance scams. So... I hope I've explained what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be focusing on cyber resilience, not digital skills or digital tools. So what we've got to think about is cyber crime as an industry. It's not an individual acting by yourself or a small group of individuals. This is a billion pound industry with its own internet called the dark web and its main commodity on that is data, you know, where you can buy and sell personal data. So we're going, we have to get away from the mindset that as a lone individual, as a cyber criminal, this is a multi-billion pound industry that reaches all over the world. So there's different categories of cyber crime. We have cyber dependent crime. And these are only offences that can be committed using a computer connected to the internet. Okay, and we'll get cyber enabled crimes. These are the more traditional crimes like fraud, grooming, bullying, which are enabled by computers. And so what we need to categorise the different types of crimes and understand the different dependent enabled crimes to understand the risks associated with people using this technology. So here's just a list of cyber enabled crimes and cyber dependent crimes. And you can see down the left hand side there's all your enabled crimes and, and you can see these crimes happened way before computers were invented. Um, so they're not dependent on the internet and they're not dependent on social media. Um, these happened, you know, you had grooming happen, child sexual abuse happened, harassment, bullying and gambling all happened before the internet was invented. Whereas your cyber dependent crimes like viruses and ransomware and hacking rely on a computer. If I removed computers from cyber dependent crimes or the internet for cyber dependent crimes, the crimes wouldn't happen. Hacking can't happen without a computer. A ransomware attack attacks your hard drive on your computer. So if you didn't have that computer, then that crime would not take place. And what have you noticed about cyber enabled and cyber dependent? Your cyber enabled Crimes or risks attack the person of people using the device, whereas your cyber dependent ones focus purely on the device itself and attack the device. So your iPad can get a virus, a computer virus. I can't get a virus. Okay, your phone can be hacked. I can't be hacked. And that's the sort of mindset you've got to think about as you're going to start working with people on the cyber resilience, you need to understand, is it enabled or dependent? Is it affecting the device that the person's using or is it affecting the person? This is the Scottish Government 
um, definition of cyber resilience. Yeah, I'm not going to read that out to you. You can look at it. The key things for me are we have to recover, right? And that's a key thing that we'll need to look at. How do we recover from attack? As more and more things become connected to the internet, then it increases your risk of becoming a victim of a cyber crime or a deliberate or accidental attack. So we need to learn how to recover from this. And within Education Scott, within the digital team, when I'm out working with um, schools and teachers, what we look at is the three R's of resilience, recognise, react and recover. So this is going to be one of the themes through today. We're going to look at different examples. And what we need to be able to do is recognise that risk, react to the risk and recover from the risk. And this is the three R's of cyber resilience. And we're going to spend a bit of time and look at through through some examples, looking at youth work, adult learning and capacity building as we go through the presentation. So feel free to ask any questions. As we go and look at these examples, I have tried to stay away from the CEOP examples because most um, local authorities will have CEOP ambassadors. And this is just about introducing you to some more resources um, that might help you support the people that you're working with rather than just the CEOP ones. And as I say, you've all got CEOP ambassadors within your local authority and you can work with them if you've got, um, would like to know more about the CEOP resources and the Think You Know resources. So if we're looking at youth work, we've got to ask three questions. Sorry, jumped on a wee bit there. We've got to, as we're working with youth work, I would say we've got to ask these three questions. What are they using? Who are they talking to? And how are they spending money? The reason why I've put these three questions together is there's two main motivations for cybercrime. It's financial gain and sexual gratification. So we've got to identify what platform is a young person using? Who are they talking to on that platform? And how are they spending their money? Okay, so if we have these three simple questions, it allows us to understand what they're using, and then we can try and identify the risk whether it's a cyber-enabled risk or a cyber-dependent risk. So we'll go through a wee example of that in a minute regarding online gaming. And just keep these three questions in mind. So what are they using? They're using online games. Again, I've picked youth work because um, a lot of kids are playing online games just now. So. We're looking at the, these games. So we've got on the left-hand side, we've got a game called Among Us. We've then got Fortnite in the middle, which if you've got kids of primary school age or uh, early secondary school, we'll be playing this this type of game. And then what we've got is counter-offensive global strike back, uh, which is a, a computer game, which is a different type of shoot, shoot em up game. Now, if you look at Among Us, I would class this as low risk very low risk game okay so if you look at this game and if you play this game with a, a young person you'll see you're put into the game with different strangers you don't know the people you can drop into a game with between five and ten different people part of the game is somebody's an imposter it's very likely the game of cluedo you've got to figure out who the imposter is so that imposter might go uh, along and murder a crewmate and then you've got to figure out who's the murderer who's the imposter so we'll look at that game. Now, they can communicate within this game. So yeah, you can talk to other people and say, I think it was blue, I think it was green. And so they're communicating with strangers. You might say, oh, there's a risk associated there with somebody building a relationship with them and then um, you know, possibly grooming them. But the game only lasts for five minutes. And then you put in another game with another set of random people. You don't generally play with the same people over and over again. So they've not got a chance to build that relationship to influence the young person. And there's no currency in there. You can't spend your money within that game. So we know what they're using. They're using Among Us. It was probably a mobile game on the mobile phone or tablet. They're playing with strangers and they're communicating with people. But the games are very random and has a limited time. Because so once everybody, all the crewmates are dead within the game, then the game ends and the imposter's won. But if you guess who the imposter is, See, it's green, and the game ends there, and it says green was the imposter. So then we move on to Fortnite. Again, shoot them up again. Right? 
However, in this game, we've got a thing called microtransactions, where young people can have their own in-game currency. And in Fortnite is V-Bucks. And this in-game currency can be used to buy things like skins. Skins is an outfit, the character wears. And you can see in this example, there's five characters there, all dressed differently. And that's what a skin is. You can buy weapons. So you have to buy V-Bucks from Microsoft or Sony um, to enable you to make in-game purchases. So it's a, called a microtransaction. So I would have to get my uh, £20 birthday money and turn that into um, 30,000 V-Bucks. Right. The interesting thing about most of these currencies used within games, there's no exchange rate, as if you were going on holiday. Uh, if I was going to Portugal, then I would go and buy my euros, and I know I'd get, for one pound, I would get one euro fifty. There's no real exchange rate within these games, any online game, um, where you're, you're buying your currency, there's no exchange rate. You can't go to different places to get a better deal. The only time you get a better deal with your v box. Um, then game currency for Fortnite is if it's away from the main store and that is, um, increases the risk of buying um, V-Bucks from um, a cyber criminal. Usually if it's away from the main store like uh, Microsoft or Sony, then the, the problem bought by us, bought, bought using a stolen credit card and then they're trying to get real currency back. So uh, again, like any sort of um, young person, I try to get the best deal. I don't want to spend all my my money, I could for, buy these 30,000 for £20 off Sony, but I can get them for um, £10 for 20,000 V-Bucks off somebody else I, I've met in social media. Again, understanding how they're spending that money, where are they getting their V-Bucks from. Again, there's a chat facility within Fortnite as well, where you can talk to people, you can play pro prolonged periods of time with uh, people and build a relationship with people through chat, and they might help you out in the game. Again, that would increase the risk to me. So we've got currency, uh, we've got um, microtransactions within there, and we've got the ability to communicate a lot more with people uh, uh, in build a relationship and playing teams. So that increases the risk to Fortnite. Again, looking at who they're talking to, if they're talking to strangers and playing with strangers, and this is somebody I've not met physically, um, again, unfortunately, I wouldn't use the term stranger, because as soon as you, a young person's in a game, Playing with somebody, they're no longer a stranger. Or oh, that's uh, Scott. He's helped me out in this mission, and so they're, they're not a stranger. I've played with him before. I know him, but you've not actually physically met him. And then the the last game I've got here is a uh, um, global uh, global offen offensive strike back. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, and this is a, sh a shoot 'em up game. Um, again, you can even tell with the graphics a wee bit more adult, but again, the risks associated with this we communicate with people. And yet yeah, there's in-game currency. But linked to this game is third-party websites where I can gamble my gun. I can take it and on a relate wheel and the chips down and saying, oh, that's £10 on uh, Black Red. I can put my gun in Black Red and there'll be a value allocated to that gun. I can cash in my guns and get uh, get money back. So I could say, right, oh, uh, I want to sell this gun and then I can cash out um, and take my money. So this increases the risk of gambling uh, and some of the issues around in-game gambling can be associated with this game. So you can see the risks, um, different different risks associated with different games, but you don't know what the risks are to sit in and talk to a young person and find out what they're playing, who they're talking to and how they're spending their money. And these are this is how you would recognise the risk within online gaming. So looking at it, is it enabled or dependent? Online gaming, I would probably say enabled because people have always gambled on, you know, football, rugby, any type of sport, the ball, horse racing, they've gambled there. When you go to the amusement arcade, you get the, a, um, you, you, the machines, you put your £10 in and try and win a teddy, they sort of grab our machines. So we've got to think about, is it enabled or dependent? Then we've got to remember we're supporting the young person. Right, so we're mentoring them, we're not monitoring their activity. We always want to take the, the stance of mentoring people, allowing them to make a, a decision or a choice, Okay, not monitoring young person. Um, so if we're playing Fortnite and we start playing with somebody we don't know who they are, well, before sharing any personal details with them, let's take their, their gaming handle, let's Google their gaming handle, let's see if we can find them in any other social media. 
um, and make sure they're who they say they are. And again, the best way to find out what the risks associated with young people are is, is play the game, observe them in their you know, as they're playing their game and what comes naturally to them. Because I'm sure if you asked any young person you work with, do you play online games with strangers? No, I don't. I'm not that silly. But they'll play online games with people they have not physically met or know very little about them. They'll only believe what they've been told within the game. And that can either be through the chat or talking to them, um, similar to what we're doing today. So, again, that increases the risk. But if you play the game with a young person, then you can observe how they're using the game and what the risks associated with that. So that allows you to react to that risk. Rather than talking to them about grooming and playing games with strangers and all they're playing is among us, and you don't really get that chance to build build a relationship with the person playing the game with you. So again, how do we cover from the risk? Well, research the game before you start playing them. Is there microtransactions within the game? That's that in-game purchases to have its own currency. You know, so if somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to start playing this game, right? let's do a wee bit of research on it. Let's find out if there's microtransactions within there. Is there a currency in there? That means we're going to spend more money in there. Is there a chat facility in the game? So am I going to be able to talk to people? Okay. And then as you start playing the game and you start um, communicating with people within the game, you start thinking, right, let's start... Um, researching the people we've played with. Every game will have a gaming handle and they'll use the same gaming handle all the time. But if you can't find any information in this person's gaming handle, then, then that would be a, a wee bit of a red flag, a bit of a warning sign. Especially do this with people you've not physically met. If you've got younger learners maybe playing roadblocks within primary school, then what tends to happen is um, the parents help them set up the accounts, uh, the parents will show them how to friend people or they'll say, let's search for your friends in school. Let's search for Scott. And then, oh, this is Scott's username, Scott Hunter 19. So then we can go and look at that. And then you know that's somebody they actually go to school with. And again, that reduces the risk. But if they're just communicating with strange, um, strangers, I hate using that term, with people they've not physically met, then that's a, a different risk. Uh, always get them to stay in, if they're using chat, always get them to stay in the public chat areas. Don't move to direct messaging or private messaging, okay, unless you've researched the person. It's okay for young people to build friendships online, but we need to make sure we're reducing the risk. So before we move on to direct messaging, let's make sure we've, we've looked at this, um, try to find out as much information about this person. Have, have we been able to cross-reference what they're telling us? Do they, you know, if they live in East Lothian? Is that what the gaming handle says, or does it say um, Scott Hunter 19 lives in East Lothian, North Ayrshire, South Ayrshire, eh, the Highlands? Then that would be a bit, a bit of concern as well. So make sure you've done a bit of research before moving to the direct messaging. Don't jump direct to direct messaging or private messaging just when you've started playing a game with somebody. And always know where to get help. So if you're concerned about a young person gambling, then fast forward a really good gambling charity. If you think somebody's shown signs of problematic gambling, then that's a, a time to get expert help, okay? And that's where these resources here can either help you around the gambling, the fast forward, or the child sexual abuse would be stop it now. Again, both are Edinburgh-based charities that are really good resources if you want to find out more about gambling online um, and then online games, fast forward's a place to go, or if you've got a concern about something around child sexual abuse, there's lots of nice resources in the Stop It Now website that can help you tackle the problems. So as you can see there, there's an example we've just walked walk through, looking at the three R's of resilience. And then if you look at adult learning, again, same questions, okay? The same questions we're going to ask, what are they using, who are they talking to, and how are they spending their money? Then these risks might be slightly different through adult learning. It might not, we're not playing online games. Okay, we might be using emails. So it might be a different method of communication. It's not a chat facility we're looking at. It might be an email that we're looking at, right? And how we email on people, you know? And that's a way, if we send somebody with bank details through email, that's a risk, okay? So again, what they're using, how they're using it. You know, most adults will have social media accounts, but to access that account, you need to set up an email and have a, a, 
um, a password associated to your email. Okay, so you'll have your own personal email and it's used to set up online banking, social media. So that's your most important account there would be your, your personal email address. And that's the one you tend to keep more secure. But we'll look at that later on in another example. So again, recognise the risk. As it, oh, it seems to be jumping on a wee bit forward. Um, as I said before, right, recognise the, the risk. We as adults will have access to a lot more online accounts. Right? All these online accounts will need an email address and a password. Right? This is just to ensure you're the person accessing that account. So some of the risks, if we're using, for example, email, increases the risk of getting malware okay, or hacked. Right? Because that email address or your personal email address, your Google or your Hotmail account, that will be your access to your online banking. So if I can get into that email address, that would be your username for your online banking, change the recovery details, see I've um, lost my password, and then the, I could take over that email account. I can take over that email account, then there's a certain number of steps I can do to take over your online bank account, like contact the bank and see I forgot my password, change the password. The code gets sent to my personal email address, and then I get access to your online bank account. So make sure you have a really strong password for your personal uh, email email account and again if you're working with adults as well making sure they're aware of this that that's the account you want to protect more than anything and again as we're using more and more services connected to the internet that allows us increases the risk of getting viruses okay which can be sent to our computer how do we recover if we get a virus on our, on, on our machine compared to how do we recover if we get hacked and again it's about recognize that risk if I'm sending a lot of files and open a, clicking on a lot of links, then that increases my chance of getting viruses on my machine. So react to the risk. I've, I've understood I'm at high risk of viruses. So let's get antivirus software. Okay, let's get antivirus software onto our machines. Um, EVG is a free antivirus software. A lot of the antivirus software companies like Trend Micro were giving out um, access to their paid for version free during lockdown, so it's possible you could go in and get a year's free subscription to antivirus software. Again, that reduces your risk. It's about thinking about layers of security. So having that antivirus software um, on, on your machine is always good to run that, um, and that can identify and remove viruses. So if you do get a virus, then the first thing you would do is try and disconnect it from the internet, disconnect your computer from the internet. And it, the reason for that is we don't know what the virus is doing in your computer. Some viruses will log keystrokes and send um, the cyber criminal an email all your keystrokes. So if you type in your email address and then the next thing below it's a password, then I can make the um, decision that's a username and pa uh, password. And usually before that, you'll put in the web address, www.rbs.co.uk. Uh, and then I've got all that information and I can log on and, and take the money that way. But again, so change your password straight away, have a secure password, disconnect from the internet to you run your antivirus software to try and get rid of that virus. So again, there's hundreds of thousands of viruses out there. Now, your virus, um, antivirus software will give you a layer of protection. It, is not, it will not stop you getting a virus, but it will add a layer of protection there to identify them. Um, and always uh, have secure passwords, but if you're working with adults, um, who find it difficult to remember passwords, then it's okay to write them down. Okay, it's about identifying the risk. You know, if you write them down in a wee book that's kept um, a, in a safe place within your home, then the risk of somebody breaking in to your home to get that book is, is quite low to get access to your online banking. Okay, a cyber criminal won't go to that uh, level of to get your password. Okay, to break into your home to get your password. So again, you can also use browsers. The browser will remember your password, password managers. These are all good things that we'll, we'll talk about to enable people to support them to um, have secure passwords. And then, as I was talking about there, create a strong password, three random words from the National Cyber Security Centre. You can use password managers. Browser will do it for nothing, but again, the thing to recognise the risk there, if you're saving your passwords to your browser and you've got a shared device, then anybody using that device, you've got access to those passwords. 
So again, if you're working with people, letting them to understand if you're saving it in your browser, then the device becomes the thing you need to protect because if I get access to your device, then I get access to all your passwords and all your accounts. So again, and then look at two-factor authentication. That's where if you've got a Gmail account, they'll send you a, a code to type in. You'll text your code, a, a code to your phone, then you have to type in, and this is what we call two-factor authentication. Adds another layer of security. Again, won't stop you being hacked, but adds a layer of security, and that's what we've got to think about layers. Um, we always update our software. Okay, I, I know it can be... Um, a bit frustrating, like in a Wednesday or a Thursday, you've got to do something and your computer needs to update and it takes 10, 15 minutes. This is where somebody's found a vulnerability in the software and they send an update or a patch to, to stop that vulnerability. It's very important you update your software and constantly update your software. If you're using computers where like Microsoft no longer um, supports Microsoft XP, if you've still got XP on your computer, then I would be looking at updating my computer because that's no longer supported by Microsoft. That means you're no longer getting updates for that and everybody will know about the vulnerabilities on that machine and then that increases your risk of being hacked. Again, to recover from a virus or hacking, what we need to do is back up our data. Make sure we're back our data up. Now, you can either back your data up on a physical hard disk that you can buy for as little as 50 quid to back up your computer there or you can back up to the cloud but when we're doing backups we need to think about how often do we back our data up you know if it's my personal computer i don't need to do it daily but if i'm working with a community group and their accounts are on that computer every time i change their accounts so i'll be doing it weekly now right? depending how often that community group work with or how often the data is changed in the computer is what i'd back up Again, you don't have to back up all your data. You just need to identify the data that's important to you, the data that you couldn't live without if your computer get damaged in a, um, an accidental attack or a deliberate attack. And again, just think about different layers. So if you're updating your software, you've got strong passwords and you've got antivirus software and you back your data up, that reduces your risk. Okay. Now we're going to look at well, our last example. And this is what we're looking at, uh, capacity building. Um, and again, same questions. What are they using? Who are they talking to? And how are they spending their money? So again, we've got some nice resources. There's National Cyber Security Centre and Cyber Aware. Um, and the one we're going to look at today is, you know, emails, phishing. Because most community groups you work with have email accounts and be sending emails to, to people. Um, so one of the things we can get within this uh, is, a phishing email, and this is an example of a phishing email for the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, the key thing within a phishing email, you receive this email. At this point, nothing's happening. Okay, you've just opened and reading an email. The problem comes when you click in the link. Okay, the link within the email takes you to another website that might look exactly the same as the Royal Bank of Scotland's, where you type in your username and password. You know, and that's what they're wanting to do. But the point of phishing scam is to get you to give them your bank account details, either your credit card details or either your, your login details for your internet banking. And again, it looks like a very plausible email you would get for the Royal Bank of Scotland. Automatic reaction human behaviour is clicking the link and let's go in and in my details because you do contact me through email the Royal Bank of Scotland. But the one thing we've got to look at within that um, email is a URL. Okay, every single website in the world has a unique URL. There can't be two rbs.gov.scots. There can't be two of them. It's impossible to have that. Now, this is an example of a URL, the Education Scotland URL. We're looking at this. There's different things in here that tells me that this is a trusted source. So, if we look at the first thing, the first part of it's called the protocol. This red part's called the protocol. Now, what I'm looking for is I don't need to know what the padlock's for, what the HTTP is for. All I'm interested in is the S. If I see that S, that means it's secure. It means it's encrypted. So that's good. I'm looking for the S. Then the next part is what we call the domain name. I'm not really bothered about that, okay? Because as we're all very busy, we've got an email, we glance at a URL, that looks right, I'll move on. I won't spend any time interrogating my URL. Right? So it's very easy 
if I removed the I for education, you'd think, oh, that's, that is education. That's fine. I'm okay. But what we need to look at is the first part, the protocol, make sure there's an S there. And the really important bit is this bit, the extension, the .gov.scot. Nobody apart from the Scottish government can get that extension. So it doesn't matter if I set up my own website, I can't get an extension called dove, sorry, .gov.scot. I can't get that one. That's only for Scottish government and it has to be approved for use. So with this extension .gov.scot and this, I know that is a reliable website, that is a secure website. I can go to that website. So again, some of the other URLs you might see is .com. .com just means commercial. Okay, so commercial, anybody can get a .com website. So if it's a real bank in Scotland, .com, we know S, mm, that's a problem. A .co, .co is just a short version of commercial. .co, .uk means that is a, a commercial website in the UK, which reduces your risk that wee bit more. So again, what we're looking for is the first bit, we're looking for the S and the extension, the last bit, the .gov.scot, right, to recognise the risk. So again, as I talked about there, the bits we're looking for is a pro protocol and extension. If we just leave the domain alone just now. So reactor risk, if you think, oh no, I have clicked on that. Oh no, I've clicked on that, that uh, link. What do I do? I put in my details. Well, the first thing you've got to do is talk about it. Right? Notify somebody. Run my antivirus software. Let your bank know. And then what you would then do is, you know, contact action fraud so they're aware of that scam. Because very seldomly will they put, um, target an individual community group. It'll be a blanket email sent out to everybody. There might be a thousand of them across uh, Scotland sent out and you'll just so happen that you've clicked on it. And it's just human nature. You can click on it. Again, run your antivirus software. Make sure nothing's been installed on your computer. Any spyware's been installed on your computer. Change your password straight away and block the email. Most of your emails, like, uh, you know, Google, you'll be able to block an email address, so block that one so it doesn't happen to you again. And report it, okay? Because you might have fell victim of this scam, that's okay, but you want to stop somebody else becoming the victim of that scam and making people aware of it that this is an unknown problem just now. So, again, how do you react to that? It's okay, we've clicked on the link. What do we need to do? We need to get back and make sure we're running an antivirus software and change your passwords. Notify your bank if you have put in your bank details to a suspect website and then notify Action Fraud in the email so they can try and remove that email or make other people aware that that email is doing the rounds and being circulated. The worst thing you could do is do nothing. Okay? As the worst thing you can do, I know it can be quite embarrassing. It's just human nature to think, God, no, I can't believe I fell for that scam. But if you're very busy, you've got a lot of work happening, you may be homeschooling happening as well. So your men's not 100% on it and you're just like, oh, another email. Oh, great, I'll do that just now where I'll get five minutes quickly doing it. And that's what these uh, fraudsters rely on for you to be rushed. So even if you just sit, but I'm not sure about that email, think about it before you, you go uh, and um, enter in your details. So how do you recover from it? Um, what I would suggest is for, for if you're working with community groups uh, or you're working with a community group, then they don't use personal emails or personal devices for business. Okay, it's easy to separate them. Okay, so that would be my key tip. You know, don't use your personal computer to um, work or do the accounts for a community group because that that increases the risk. Um, always check your URLs and have antivirus software and back your data up. It's really important. Really important that you you check the URL before you put it in. Just that checking and reading it can stop you becoming a victim. But if you do become a victim, let us know how we recover from it. Okay, you know we've noticed that there's an increase in ransomware attacks being sent through emails, and you click in that instead of putting in your details, where it does encrypt your whole hard drive and says send me six hundred pound and I'll give you your data back. Now, if I've got my data backed up and I'm just like no, I don't have to give you the six hundred pounds. And again, ransomware is a really big thing just now. It's worth billions of pounds, ransomware attacks, and it just encrypts your data. Um, and again, that is about having that admission that I've clicked on that link or no. Making sure that everybody else you work with knows not to open that email, not to click on the link, uh, and, and we've got ransomware on your computer system and you've got all over your, 
you know, the different members of a community group you're working with. So again, really focusing that is about the, the layers of security and you know what to do if you do click on a link, okay? And then a wee example, a wee scenario here, if so we read this um, URL when we think about what is the problems with it. So I'll give you a minute to um, have a think about that. So remember what we're looking at, so what are the key things we're going to look at. So we're looking at the protocol, which is a bit at the beginning, and the extension. Yeah. So you can see here, in the protocol, there's no S. So it's no secure. That's a concern straight away. Right? Then we look at the end, .co .ru. Well, I know .co means commercial. But what does RU mean? That is its origin. That's Russia. RU means Russia. So the Royal Bank of Scotland isn't secure, right? There's no S. And the website's based in Russia. No, I don't like this. I'm not going to click on that link. And just in that ability to do that, commercial Russian website, no S. No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. These are some of the resources that we've talked about today. Uh, again, these are all links. Uh, and in the notes of the presentation, you'll, you'll be the URLs that you can type in and go to them. And again, these are all different links. I wanted to stay away from the normal CEOP stuff. Um, so you've got stuff in the National Cyber Security Centre. If you identify the risk as being around uh, cyber dependent stuff, then the National Cyber Security Centre is very good. Antivirus software, you've got Trend Micro, that's a red one there, very good antivirus software. And the really good thing about Trend Micro is they have resources on there if you're working with parents. So they have a scheme called Internet Safety for kids and families. So lots of resources if you want to do some a parent session around um, you know internet safety. And they cover cyber-enabled and cyber-dependent uh, risks within that website as well. So that's a very useful website, the Internet Safety kids and families you might not have heard of. There's National Parent Phone Nutshell Guides on how to secure your device as well, if you're worried about the uh, cyber-dependent crimes as well. If you're working with people where English is their second language, then the Childnet International gives you lots of internet safety advice, leaflets all uh, translated into different languages. You've got uh, Youth Link Scotland there as well, and Stop It Now if you're worried about the more serious side of it, the child sexual abuse aspect. And that is me finished.